OK. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to try and go a little slowly, because I want to try to make sure that if there's things people don't understand, you guys ask questions about it. I kind of feel like I may have rushed through things maybe a little bit yesterday. So I'm going to try to pace myself a bit more. Uh, but again, right, ask questions. If there's anything that doesn't make sense or that you want clarity on, um, or if there's cool thoughts that you guys have and you want to share that, please ask questions, all right? This is useful when there's lots of questions. OK, so we're going to talk about a, a, a theme that's really close to my heart. It's about dynamical systems and how there's been a sort of a trend towards thinking of neural activity as a dynamical system and, and approaches to fit models to neural data. Um, and this is a pretty, you know, it's not just something that's happening in neuroscience. It's happening really sort of across different um, fields. Uh, there's some really cool work by folks like Steve Brunton at U Washington where they think of this as what they call the system identification problem. You have complex nonlinear things happening in nature. You have uh, the weather, you have the stock market, you have brain activity, and there's been lots of efforts to model all of these as dynamical systems. So everything that you see today, even though I'm going to talk about this in the context of neural activity, it's super relevant to whatever you work on. If it's behavior, if it's um, you know, image functional imaging data, it's super useful. right? So, uh, and if you guys have questions on how those things link to each other, please, again, ask and, and talk about it. OK. So let's recap a little bit what we talked about yesterday. Right? Um, I want to take off from this idea that we spoke about, which is that there's different ways of thinking about the utility of dimensionality reduction when we're dealing with neural data. This, this hypothesis that dimensionality reduction is maybe what people call the weak principle. This is the idea that it's really just a way of reducing the complexity of your data. If you have 1,000 neurons, you don't want to think about what all of them do. You want to think about may maybe what 10 piece principal components do instead. But there's another hypothesis, which is what we, what we call the strong principle, which suggests that dimensionality reduction is giving you a hypothesis for how the system actually works. So let's take some data, and let's perform some kind of dimensionality reduction. Right? The idea of the strong hypothesis is that What's important is not just looking at a spaghetti plot and trying to and sort of you know interpreting where different behaviors lie exactly, but it's the idea that there's something underneath it that's generating this particular space. The reason that you see a lot of squiggly lines here is because there's some portion or there's a valley in terms of the manifold that shapes this this, this latent state space, so that activity can have has to be here for some amount of time, right? We call these things as attractors, and we'll talk about this in more detail when we sort of go into the anatomy of a dynamical system. But these are very important because they could be linked to memory, for example. They could be linked to decisions. And so there's often a very close mapping between the properties of the actual space, what we call the underlying manifold, and actual properties and, and computations performed by circuits. Right? And dynamical systems in this context is simply the language right? that's going to help us describe and understand the underlying manifold, and talk about these computations. Okay, So let's think about what dynamical systems are. Right? Dynamical systems are really just a way of describing any system that changes over time. It's, it's really, at the, at the heart of it, a super simple idea. Right? A pendulum that's moving, its position can be thought of as a dynamical system. Right? If you take an apple, you put it on the ground, it falls down in a predictable way, that's a dynamical system. So in, when we talk about this, we're not talking about some fancy, fancy Equation, it's a really simple idea. It's simply any quantity that changes over time. Now, in the context of neural circuits, though, it's often sort of good to think about dynamical systems as operating on two different levels. Now, anytime you record activity, you're not recording activity in a vacuum, right? This is a consequence of a lot of different inputs the system's receiving. This could be sensory inputs that are maybe like orders in the environment, if you're talking about social behavior. It could be, for example, decision variables, if you're talking about decision tasks. And so in a dynamical system, we formulate the evolution of activity x as a nonlinear function of both its current state, the current activity, as well as external inputs to the system. Right? This is sort of a very simple formulation of a dynamical system. Here, x is, for example, the firing rate of all our neurons. So it's basically going to be a vector that changes over time. And u is going to be all the different external inputs that the circuit receives. Right? And f is this nonlinearity. So it's, it's sort of good to think about where this nonlinearity comes from, right? Because this really makes our life extremely hard. Um, in fact, there's often a common joke that what gives dynamical systems people their job security is the fact that nonlinear systems exist. There's no theory of nonlinear dynamics that exists today. And so um, as a result, you know, these systems are just really hard to understand. Think of the weather, right? So wh where does the nonlinearity come from, right? Are there sort of any ideas? Do you guys have any thoughts? Yeah. 
neurons, right, they are nonlinear, right? You give them some input, they don't spike until a particular point, and then there's a threshold at which they start spiking. A simple example of a nonlinearity, right? You could think about the nonlinearity also existing as you make a transformation from the behavior to the latent space. There's a lot of different sources of this, and there's some sort of, you know, people who have been thinking about this, Mariam Shinechi, who will be talking later in the week, has a paper that says, where's all the nonlinearity? Because often we can get away with using simpler linear systems. And it's good to think about what the utility of this is. We'll talk about this more in the discussion section, in the uh, philosophy part, like what's the actual utility of nonlinear systems? Um, but you know, in reality, every system is actually really complicated, right? It's going to be a nonlinear nature. So we'll talk about that in a second, right? Um, but basically, if you sort of open up this equation, so f is basically some function, right? You can write it in the form that it's basically going to be a matrix times this um, vector x, and that matrix is going to account for interactions within the system. And in the next slide, when, we, when I sort of look at this in a linear fashion, it'll become much more clearer what that, those interactions are. Good question. OK. Um, there's sort of one more idea that's important here, which is that Nonlinearity makes not just the interpretation and fitting of these models hard, but it also gives rise to very complex dynamics and gives rise to things like chaos, bifurcations. Um, you, you know, you've heard of maybe other things like strange attractors. These are all sort of ideas that basically provide a system where even if you know the initial conditions of the system, even if you know the equations of the system, you can't accurately predict what the system is going to do forward in time. And that's sort of the, the difficulty of a nonlinear system, right? We're going to make our life a bit more easier by thinking of this as a linear system first. And we're going to build a lot of intuition about what are the computations that linear systems can perform. This is useful because ultimately, even when you think about what nonlinear systems are, when you think about things like recurrent neural networks, we actually perform a thing called linearization to those models, which is that you actually think of them as linear systems to understand them. Because as I mentioned, there's really no good way right now to think about theories for nonlinear systems. The only way we understand nonlinear systems is through the lens of linear systems, right? So this is really important for that reason. Okay. So as a linear system, we can write it, we can take off that particular nasty um, function f of x, make it a simple linear equation, so that the evolution of x, our activity, depends upon two different matrices, A and B, right? So again, x is the firing rate of all our neurons, and B are the external inputs to a particular um, circuit. So as I mentioned before, RNNs are understood through linearization, so these equations are still important, even if you want to understand things like RNNs. So A basically captures the interactions taking place within that dynamical system. And this is basically the, the term that you were just talking about. Right? It's basically going to describe how activity in the system will evolve in time if there's no inputs to the system. And really, we're going to understand this dynamical system by breaking down and dissecting A. So one of the things we'll do next when we sort of think about this and build some intuition so I'm going to give you different examples of what A could look like and show you different types of sort of complex dynamics that can arise. And this is going to tell us where the building blocks of dynamical systems are. Right? But it's important not to forget B, right? For a pun, be careful. Um, you might overestimate what the intrinsic contributions are in a dynamical system if you don't really take into account what the external inputs are. Right? If you, for example, observed some data and you modeled it completely without including an input term, you might be misled to think that there's something complicated happening in your data, when in reality, all of that complex dynamics could be inherited. Right? It could be coming in from an upstream source. And so for this reason, B is really important. Yeah? Um, is there any reason to have the neural activity be the input and have the state space like in the system matrix be more of like a behavioral or other kind of latent space activity that, you know, I mean, such that the, right. the system itself is not just the firing? Right, right. So um, you can reformulate these models so that you can basically have x existing in a different kind of latent space. And so you can have both of them existing in different latent spaces. And we'll sort of touch upon those kind of models at the end. This is just sort of kind of building up towards those kind of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, so yeah, you in this case is capturing anything that's sort of thought to be extrinsic to that circuit. right? We're not just talking about behavior here, but this could be really anything else. It could be capturing certain, for example, feedback loops or something like that could also exist that you think is not part of that circuit. Great, more questions, all right? OK, so let's try to think about what this matrix A is, right? Let's sort of now convert this all into matrix notation. So x, as I mentioned before, is our firing rate of neurons. It can be written as a matrix n times t, 
n is the number of neurons, t is our number of time points. Um, u is going to be another vector that describes the time evolving inputs to the system. It can be written as an other matrix, m times t, right? m is just the dimensionality of your input space. It could be 10, it could be 15, et cetera, depending upon how you model this. So do you guys have a sense of what, if this was, if we were thinking of this as a recurrent neural network, right, which is kind of how we've written it right now, it's a linear recurrent neural network, what do you think A actually means in this context? What's the meaning of A? What's the physical meaning of A in this context? Right. It's capturing interactions between neurons, which is the connectivity. Right? So A in this case is basically the connectivity matrix of the circuit. It's going to be an n by n matrix that's going to describe all the constraints imposed by connectivity in the circuit, all the different interactions among the different neurons. OK. So one of the ways that we'll sort of understand the different computations that the circuit can perform is to dissect A by performing an eigen decomposition. So this is basically why it was really important for us yesterday to go through different things like eigen decomposition, think about singular value decomposition, because this same process is going to be essential for understanding the computations performed by the circuit. Yes? I would say A is a covariance matrix then? So A in this case is, strictly speaking, if you had a system where you can measure the connectivity, it would be the connectivity matrix. People think of this often as sort of functional connectivity because it's sort of the relationship at that time point and not necessarily sort of something that's static to the network. Um, but in, in a strict sense, it would be the connectivity. It would be physical interactions between neurons imposed by synapses. Right, so when we don't have that in our data, what is it actually? So we want to estimate that, right? So we can't get away with that by just using the covariance. And that's the whole process about how do you fit a dynamical system to estimate A, right? Some people do sort of hand wave this, and they say that maybe the covariance is the closest you can get to this. But we'll see that you can actually start estimating the dynamical system. You can start getting better estimates of A. Yeah. OK. So we're going to now sort of walk through a few. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. What's the difference? Sorry. Yes. So is it different from the vector x, uh, one dimension? Yes. So um, a vector x, so if you assume that t is one dimension, yeah. right? Yeah, so you, you could write it that. So if you write x of t, x is going to be a single vector. It's not going to have that time component. That's fine. It just depends on how you formulate that equation. This is just sort of, yeah. Um, when you want to simulate a dynamical system, it's not important because all you need is exactly just the initial x, and then you can simulate forward in time. Yeah. But when you want to fit models and stuff, you need that whole time series because that's where it's going to be important to sort of think about how, how is activity changing over time. Yeah. So no, yeah. Mm. So are very different from the non diagonal terms because they yes. rather than representing connections, they represent the initial, the, sorry, the internal yes. thermal dynamics of the cell. Yes, yes, exactly. Does that matter? That does matter. And in fact, sort of how you regularize that diagonal matters a lot for the circuit. If you regularize it to be zero, then you sort of ensure that there's no like autaps in the circuit, there's no feedback within a single cell. And you sort of ensure that all the connectivity, all the dynamics are generated by the actual interactions instead of intrinsic time constants. But if you include it, then you can start playing around with things like intrinsic time constants. You can consider the fact that some cells decay much more slowly if you give them a certain pulse, irrespective of their connectivity to other neurons. And you can actually model that by playing around with the diagonal. So that's a really good point. And so we'll just talk about that. So I'm, when I sort of, sort of provide examples of A, we're first going to talk about uncoupled systems where there's going to be no interactions between the elements, but just an interaction within each neuron, because that's going to make our interpretation a lot easier. And then we'll go to the couple case where neurons can interact. Sorry, there's another question. Yeah. My question is, uh, you were saying this network is a recurrent network. Yep. So which term then is it's, it's A. So recurrent here means that because different elements of these different neurons can interact with each other, it's not feed forward, right? Basically, at every time point, you have to sum together both what are the other neurons doing to this particular neuron, as well as the external inputs? And so one way of actually training these models, especially when you do behavior, is something called backpropagation through time, where you basically unfurl the RNN. 
and you basically considered every time step, what are all the different summations that you take place. And there's sort of these perspectives that RNNs are, some, are thought to be sort of the deepest of neural networks, because you can sort of, sort of keep unfurling an RNN to have multiple layers, where each layer is sort of all the different connectivity and connectivity and so on. So there's some cool literature in that space. But yeah, that's what A is going to be. OK, any other questions so far? Okay. Now we're going to go through some example simulations right, that I'm going to show you. So consider a simple two neuron system. right? What I want to sort of provide an intuition for is sort of understanding this matrix A and understanding what the eigenvalues of this matrix A can tell us about dynamics. Because ultimately, you know, we'll go through some examples of actually seeing systems where you can you know, measure flow fields and things like that. I'll, I'll describe what that is. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I just, that's arbitrary, right? It can be a single term. It can be one by t in the sense that it is a single variable that you believe exists in the environment. Uh, this could be, for example, something to do with decisions in your environment or something to do with order if you're thinking about social behavior, right? Um, and so it's a dimensionality that we set. Um, and also the description of what consists of external inputs is really crucial. And I'll talk about that in the philosophy side. Um, there's a lot of work trying to figure out, like, can you truly identify what's extrinsic just from neural activity without doing any kind of you know, recordings of, say, pose estimation, which can give you things about distance between animals if you're dealing with social behavior, or like covariates if you're thinking about decision making and stuff like that. So the B would be a matrix of M by M? Yeah, exactly. It would be M by M. Great. Okay. So as I mentioned before, we're going to work, walk through some examples of what different matrices A can look like. We're going to see what their eigenvalues look like. And then we're going to sort of build up a relationship of just inferring from the eigenvalues some very important properties of the system. Right? This will be sort of the building blocks towards understanding RNNs later, especially in week two. OK, so let's consider a system. I've designed the system in such a way that it has self-inhibitory weights. Right? So the diagonal elements here basically reflect the fact that this neuron is going to be self-inhibiting each other with a small value, minus 0.2. And this neuron is going to be inhibiting each other. But there's no off-diagonal elements here, meaning that this system is a completely uncoupled system. Neurons are not interacting. We're going to do this for the sake of simplicity, and then we'll go to the coupled case. OK. So to simulate the system, so I have, this, I have this dynamical system, right? It's going to have this equation, Ax plus Bt. I'm going to give the system a one-dimensional input, a little input. And if I simulate it, I'm going to get basically the activity of both these neurons. They're going to increase during that external input, and they're going to fall down. Right? If you think physically or intuitively from what the connectivity itself means, this should hopefully not be too surprising. These neurons are self-inhibiting so that if you give it some input, its activity is going to decay along some intrinsic time constant. Right? That's kind of what it means. But because we have, this, we have this dynamical system, we can actually completely dissect it, and we can understand it further. One way in which we can do this is we can plot activity in two dimensions. Right? We can look at what are the sum of both of these neurons doing, and we can plot this in two dimensions. And then we can use this matrix A to calculate something called a flow field. The flow field is sort of a physical representation of the rules the system follows and system has to obey in the absence of any input. So in this case, these trajectories are driven by the input. So this particular movement here is actually what's happening when you push the system out because of this input. But then for some reason, it falls back naturally to some point. And if you just look at this flow field itself, you'll notice that there's some point over here where the arrows are all pointing to. Right? We call that, um, as I mentioned, the flow field tells us how activity evolves in the absence of input. And we call such a point a point attractor, or actually, more technically, a stable fixed point. Right? It's basically just a point system falls through. Now, in this example, again, I hope it's not too surprising, because this fixed point is just when there's no activity in the system. It doesn't really mean anything. Right? It's not telling you some kind of cool memory trace or anything like that. It's what we call, in the, often in the field, a trivial fixed point. Because any neural system will always have a point where there's no activity in it. Right? It's going to always have that point that exists, in this case, of the origin, 0, 0. Okay. Is this sort of, is this idea clear? So yeah. Good question. Yeah. Uh, Ari, can you please outline the decisions that are already implemented here? Mm. Like, uh, uh, for example, you have an on constant, a, a tau on, a tau off. Yeah. Um, it's a spiking network. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. So in this case, we're just simulating basically a simple two-dimensional dynamical system. We're simulating them as continuous time variables. It's not a spiking network or anything like that. It's sort of, you can think of this as, say, like a two-neuron calcium imaging system, for example, if that's a more sort of approachable way to think about it. Um, we've given the system some external input. So activity is going to follow that input, right? Um, and there's something else that you asked, too. I forgot the first point. Yes, uh, all of the, in all ah, so we don't specify any of that. All we have, all we need to simulate this model is just this matrix A. The matrix A has all that information. It has that information about that off, that tau off, for example. We don't need to specify that explicitly, but we'll get to how we think of that using eigenvalues in a second. Right. Okay? So the reason I did this is because, you know, we often don't really have the luxury of simulating a dynamical system. We don't know where the matrix A is, right? All we often have is just some activity or something that we record, and we want to find the matrix A. But if you do it, you can go through this whole process. You can exactly make deterministic predictions of how activity would evolve. You can also then look at what we call the flow field and infer what's the kind of computation there. Is there, for example, a point that represents a stable point that we would, in this case, call a stable fixed point? OK. Yes. So this is sort of how we represent what we call flows in the space. It's called a flow field. It's basically representing the idea that if you basically started out neural activity at this point over here, the, the magnitude of the vector would tell you how strongly activity would move, and the direction tells you how, where it would move. But if, so if I like put a ball over here, this ball would flow down and then move towards this point. It'll move out faster if I place it here, because the arrows are, are more longer. If I place it over here, it'll move down to this space, but a bit more slowly, because the arrows are short. That's what the arrows are capturing. And the arrows are calculated directly from this matrix A. It's a simple transformation of this matrix into this particular 2D space. Is that clear? OK. Great. Any other questions in this particular portion? Yeah. Now, this is not a sort of a trivial thing that we learned for the sake of learning. Point attractors are in many different places in the brain. It's all over the hippocampus. There's an idea of something called discrete multistability. I'll talk about these examples a bit more when we talk about what's the utility of dynamical systems. Um, there's actually some really cool work thinking about point attractors in the context of uh, working memory from uh, actually one of David's former students, Hirohiko Inagaki. Um, and so this is important stuff, right? There's a good reason why we want to think about this. OK. One of the things I, I said that we want to do is we want to build an intuition of the relationship of eigenvalues and this particular formulation of thinking, of flow fields and stuff like that. So in this case, let's, let's consider what the eigenvalues of this matrix A are, right? Because A is sort of diagonalized, there's no diagonal elements here. The eigenvalues are simply the exact values on the diagonal terms. So the first eigenvalue of the system would be, in this case, minus 0 0.2. The second eigenvalue would be minus 0 0.5. And a common way of visualizing eigenvalues is to plot something called the eigenspectrum of A. The eigenspectrum is usually plotted in two dim dimensions. You have both usually the real portion of this value and the imaginary portion of this value plotted. The reason this is important is because in this example, the exact values are real, right? They're just simple real numbers. But if you have more complex values on the diagonals and, and other elements, you can also have a, you, this, can, this value can also be complex. So you can have both a real part and an imaginary part. And by plotting things in the state space, you can basically completely understand the behavior of the system. You don't need flow fields. You don't need anything like that. Basically, this is a succinct representation of the dynamics of the system. Now, why? There's some rules and theories to this. We're not going to go into why exactly that's the case, but I'm going to tell you what the rules are. So the rule in this case is that we've, I've anchored this coordinate space such that this particular value represents lambda equals 1. And a dynamical system where all the eigenvalues of real parts less than 1 is a stable dynamical system and will always contain a stable fixed point like this. So basically, if you had some data, you were able to get the eigenvalues of some connectivity matrix, and you see that they're all sort of shifted over here, you, know that you will know that the system will definitely have a stable fixed point. You don't have to look at flow fields or anything like that to know that. Right? This is an important point, because this is basically how we're going to interpret RNNs and stuff later on. OK. Yes? Um, what, what's the difference between the real values? Like, it's like ima basically, it's like imaginary value. Is it totally arbitrary? It's not. It's not. So I'll exactly explain why and what that will encode and what that will show in a, in a few slides. But it is an important element. So we've considered uncoupled systems, because uncoupled systems don't have imaginary components, and it just makes things a bit easier. But then we'll consider a system which has coupling and introduces imaginary components. Okay? So in a slide or two, it'll become clear. OK, any other questions?
So this sort of formulation of, of trying to find the eigenvalues is often also called a stability analysis in dynamical systems literature. Uh, and again, this is a very common thing done in all of physics. If you work in like electrical engineering, this is probably something that's very familiar to you. OK. So now let's think about a few different kinds of systems. Because now let's see what other kinds of dynamical systems can you get by just sort of playing with a simple, uncoupled, two-dimensional system. right? So in this system, I've set them to be values of 1.2 and 1.1. It basically means that there's some sort of feedback recurrence onto itself. You can sort of think about this like an autaps of a neuron. Obviously, neurons don't exactly have autapses like this, but they'll humor this for a second. OK. This exhibits a really interesting behavior, where if I give the same circuit a small amount of input, the system's going to completely blow up. Activity of these two particular neurons will keep increasing over time. If I simulate this further, this value will keep going higher and higher and higher. Right? If I look at this in phase space, what I'll see is that it looks a little similar to what we saw before, in that there looks to be a point of stability, but it's unstable. All the vectors are pointing out. Daniel. It will, yes. Yeah. But that has so one of those dimensions will blow up, but not the other. But that has Actually, eigenvalues that are less than one, but one being less than one. Yes. So in that case, one of those dimensions will not blow up because its value is going to be less than one. The other dimension will blow up. And I'll, I'll show you an example of those kind of systems a little bit, where there's going to be a mixture. It's more than, it's, it's more than zero, but less than one, and it blows up, no? If it's, so it depends on sort of how you formulate sort of the equation. So in the way we formulate it right now, 1 is our point. So if an eigenvalue is greater than 1, it's going to be unstable. Uh, if it's less than 1, it's going to be stable. That's just kind of how we formulate that. But that is typically how most dynamical systems are formulated. I I'll show you some examples. So we'll see some cases where we have mixtures of these as well. right? So we'll see systems where one dimension can blow up, but not others. OK. So such a, such a phase portrait will reveal a fixed point. But that fixed point is what we call an unstable fixed point. Right? That's a sort of an in, another sort of in, important kind of motif you can draw from a linear dynamical system. Now, if you look at the phase space of this particular system, it's going to have all its values shifted to the right of this particular origin. And systems like this, where all the eigenvalues of real parts greater than 1 are unstable. Right? So again, you don't have to do any of this analysis. If you had A, you could just simply look at the eigenspectrum, and you would know that, yeah, the system has unstable dynamics. Right? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. But the idea is that the excitation is not strong enough to sort of sustain it forever. So you can sort of think about one as an arbitrary point where like excitation becomes too strong in the circuit, so that it basically has too much feedback and activity keeps blowing up. If it's less than one, it's not strong enough. If it's less than zero, it's it's inhibitory, meaning that it basically prevents it from even blowing up even a tiny bit. It's basically sort of talking about the decay. And the exact value of the eigenvalue talks about basically the exact decay of that, of that dimension. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. OK. All right? Yes, Aya. On the spectrum, yes. um, you have the graphs, you have the points on the line. Yes. Can you just explain like, what that is supposed to represent? Yeah. yeah. So the idea, so you're talking about this, right? So yeah. yeah. So we designed this particular connectivity matrix or weight matrix to have non-coupling between it. So meaning that the neurons are not really talking to each other. And in systems like this, it's very easy to get dynamics where all the eigenvalues are real. So there's no imaginary component. Oops, sorry. There's no imaginary component. If, this, if it did have an imaginary component, you would have points, for example, lying there or there or other points which are not going to be exactly on this real line. And we'll talk about a system like that in, in a few slides. But right now, we've sort of, we're looking at examples where we can start thinking of them much more in simpler terms, and then we'll, we'll build up complexity. Yes, that's, that's one way to do it. It's not like the only way to do it. There's many ways to do it, but this is one way to do it. Okay. Yes? Now I've got some questions. Um, <clears throat> when you talk about attractors, your fixed points are stable. Can Correct. You dissociate here for us the difference between the concepts of stability and fixed point. Because it's right. counterintuitive here that you have a fixed point, right. but it's unstable. It would be like a peak. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So what is the, what is the, give us an intuition about what a fixed point is, yes. independent of whether it is yes. stable 
Yes. So a fixed point is basically any point in the state space where in the total absence of any noise or any input, activity will stay stable. So even though it's the hill of a particular, for example, valley, it's a flat hill, flat exactly locally for a small portion of space. And that's what a fixed point is. A fixed point is stable, but only in the absence of any noise or any input. If you have the tiniest amount of noise, if it basically is an unstable fixed point, activity will blow up. If it's a stable fixed point, it will still stay there because that it's basically a trough. And if you basically have any amount of noise or inputs to the system, it'll go out but come back to that trough. That's the difference between stability and the fixed points. Fixed points are always stable, but only in the total absence of any kind of, um, of, of, of noise in the system, which you can never guarantee. So it, it, it's basically a fixed point, but it's a trivial fixed point is almost entirely always a stable fixed point. So it's going to be like the example we saw first, where basically it just represents a point where there's no activity in the system, and there's no capacity to blow up as well. So That's typically. I thought this one is saying there's no activity at this fixed point, but it's unstable. Yes, it's unstable because you can have noise in the system, right? Even a small amount of noise can kick you out. So in that sense, it is. You're never almost going to see that system be completely in that fixed point ever, because there's noise and there's other things that can actually keep pushing you out. So in a neural systems or neural circuits term, when we talk about trivial fixed points, we're often always usually talking about stable fixed points, because it's referring a point where you know, neural activity can go up because of an input, then it can come back down back to that baseline point. In this system, the system will never come back down. It'll just keep going up. It can be, but not always. OK, any other questions in this space? I think there was someone else who had, who had a question. So OK. What's the cost of not a fixed point? I mean, say there is like not a fixed point. What's the cost of Yeah, so uh, um, there's some, that's some cool stuff. We'll, we'll not talk about it exactly, but yes. So you can have marginally stable points. You can have what people call slow points, which are basically approximations of fixed points. And this is where things get nonlinear. So in nonlinear dynamical systems, you, it's, you're, not, you're not always going to have an exact fixed point. You're going to have slow points, where basically things appear like it's basically settling down into basically a, a trough in an energy landscape sense, but the trough is not very deep. And so it's basically sort of unstable in itself. So you can have things like slow points in nonlinear systems. So nonlinear means not Nonlinear means that basically f of ax. You can think of it that way. OK. We have a few more examples to go through, so let's think about this a bit more. Um, this is my favorite example, because it's going to be relevant to my work, as well as some other cool things that the brain does. Um, so here's a system where we've designed in such a way that one value is exactly one. This is sort of a, almost a special edge case, and one value is less than one. OK? Let's take a look at what happens. If I give the system a small amount of input, activity for this particular neuron, where the value is basically 0 0.2, We'll follow that and then fall down, right? Yes. But I'm, I'm sorry to harp on this, but if your equation is the XTC of AX, yep. then in fact, it's not going to fall down. So there's actually a negative leak term you need to include to make the system basically have, there's a negative leak term you need to include to make it basically represent exactly an RNN. It's going to be a minus X term over here, which is how we typically formulate RNNs. And that'll explain why the value is at, at 1. But 1 is sort of the most common sort of case. We're going to stick to that formulation for now. So you, so you left out the term minus xt yes. in your equation. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Yes. All right. Mm. OK, let's keep going, right? So we provide, a little bit of, we provide an external input to the system. Activity for this dimension will fall down. But activity for this dimension, right, the one where it's exactly 1, is going to remain stable over here. And this is a very special use case. Now, let's take a look at first the flow field of this, and then I'll talk about why this is useful in a systems neuroscience term. Right? If you look at the flow field here, you'll see that the system is initially at this point over there, um, which is representing 0, 0. Right? When you give it a small amount of input, it's going to get out of that, and it's going to, an, going to go to another point, which is also a fixed point of that system. The system basically has many fixed points, an example of what we call a line attractor. Right? And a line attractor is, is, is defined in this case, in this formulation, as a system with an, with an eigenvalue exactly equals 1. That's a perfect line attractor. Right? There's some in interesting things that happen when you have slight variations when it's not exactly 1. But that's basically going to be what we call a perfect line attractor. If you look at this in space space and you see an eigenvalue exactly equals 1, 
That's, that's when you know that you have a, a really interesting dimension that's going to basically have this property of being persistently active for a large amount of time. Okay, to formulate that, it's basically a system where the eigenvalues are of one dimension, right? Of one of these terms, it's much larger than the others, and it's basically as close to one as possible. That's basically what we call formula line attractor. Now, it's interesting to me and to also a lot of other people because this is kind of really ubiqu ubiquitously seen across the brain. It's sort of thought to be underlying the ocular motor integrator in the brain, which stabilizes your head direction. It's thought to be present in the cortex for evidence accumulation, be found in the hypothalamus for emotion, encoding internal states. And so it's a pretty common motif reused in the brain for a lot of different things. And so it's a good thing to know and, and to understand. Any questions on this so far? OK. So let's think about a bit more of a use case of why you would need a, a, a thing, something like a line attractor. right? Let's give the system two different inputs now. So we have one input. This causes activity in this one dimension to go up and remain stable. But if you give it a second input, it goes up again and remains stable. right? So what is it actually doing? It's actually integrating those inputs. Line attractors basically have a property of integration. right? They can basically integrate any arbitrary input, and they can, they can accumulate different things over time. This is with the utility in evidence accumulation. This is also what we think is the utility in thinking of internal states. right? So the computation that this simple linear system can perform is integration. And it can do this basically by having a line attractor, right? by where one particular eigenvalue is close to one as possible. OK, so we're going to summarize. Oh, before that, I want to show you one more example of this, and then we'll summarize, which is basically going to be the case where you have off-diagonal elements. Neural circuits are never existing in isolation. They have connectivity. right? They have interactions between each other. Now, when you have off-diagonal elements, things get a bit more chaotic, quite literally. So you provide the same system now with an external input. In addition to the system following that input, you'll start seeing little oscillations in this particular system that I've, I've designed. If you look at its space space, you'll see that there is a particular fixed point, but now the vectors are, look a little different. They're not all pointing into the fixed point. They have this property of oscillation. right? And so if you look at the, the phase space of this particular equation, in addition to basically thinking about where it lies on this particular real axis, you'll also have to start thinking about where it lies on the imaginary axis. And in fact, the magnitude of this determines basically the frequency of that oscillation. So both of these terms, the exact eigenvalue, the, the real part, and the imaginary part, contribute to thinking about these systems. OK, is that clear? Coupling can introduce a lot of interesting dynamics this way. Yeah? You, you were answering the question uh, uh, that Daniel asked. You said that you omitted the leak term, but the leak term is there to explain why x2 goes back down again at the offset of the input in the previous example. Yep. But shouldn't that also apply Yes. Yes. So the, de the extent of decay basically depends upon both the stability of the eigenvalue, basically how close it is to one, but also things like noise, right? So basically that de so if you have an eigenvalue equal to one, that minus x term basically almost doesn't matter anymore because the system can self-sustain, and so x two is still affected by that term because of the fact that its eigenvalue is much less than that. It still doesn't have this property of self-sustaining activity, but both of these things are still sensitive to things like noise. So you can have small variations along the line, because the line is basically an, an arbitrary set of fixed points. So you can basically either stay there, move a little bit in any direction. And this is what people call drift, for example, in evidence accumulation. So people talk about this as what we call drift diffusion, where you're not going to see a, a perfectly increasing line. You're going to see sort of arbitrary movements, because the line track is arbitrarily stable. You can kind of keep moving it out along it in a noisy fashion. As long as you're, you're reaching some bound, you can basically integrate and, 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 and accumulate that evidence effectively. OK. Yes? Yeah. So it's not that easy to have two different fixed points when you have a, a linear dynamical system. And that's where you have to start thinking about how do you account for that, right? If you know your system has two different fixed points, do you need to go nonlinear? Or can you maybe start thinking of this as a set of two different linear systems? And that's one of the approaches we'll use. Uh, and thinking of the example at the end. OK. Um, so just to sort of highlight that, when you have imaginary parts, you have oscillations. And basically, the, the magnitude of the imaginary part determines the frequency of that oscillation. OK. Let's summarize this, right? So as I mentioned, 
Eigen spectrum can reveal two important features of the dynamical system. The real part basically determines whether or not activity for one particular eigenvalue will either decay or expand or remain exactly the same following an input. And the imaginary part determines the frequency of the oscillation. Right? And as a result, you can get all these different really cool dynamics simply from a linear system with either a stable fixed point, an unstable fixed point, basically a line attractor, or with oscillations. Yes. So in, in that case, basically, you integrate across both your dimensions. And you start getting things like plane attractors as a result of that. So you can have line attractors in more than one dimension. And line attractors, when you have just one dimension that shows that property. But yeah, you can, you can have arbitrarily, basically, any number of integrators in your system. And as you get to things like you know, grid cells and, like, and place cells, people sort of often think about them as being continuous attractors in many, many dimensions. Um, people like talk about this as like toroids and stuff like that, but they basically all mean that kind of system. It's a continuous attractor in many dimensions. But yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the things I want to sort of highlight is we've looked at all these as two neuron examples, right? We've seen what what you can do with just two different eigenvalues. I just want to highlight here that these ideas basically completely generalize to very high dimensional data. You can have arbitrary number of dimensions in your data, and you can you can start generating, for example, face portraits that have, for in this case, in the first example many, many, many different uh, eigenvalues. In this case, they're all less than one. But in this case, a few different dimensions are greater than one, and they basically represent unstable dimensions in your face space. Right? So if you saw this particular face portrait, this particular eigenspectrum, you'd know that these dynamics are one you should maybe think about, because they represent these unstable directions in state space. You can have a case where, for example, you can have clustering of different eigenvalues along, in this case, two particular different values of real values. And that can give you, for example, two different intrinsic time scales in your network. Another example of this is what we've exactly seen. You have one eigenvalue really close to one, or exactly one, and that can basically completely dominate behavior of your system. And that's basically a approximate line attractor in this example. But, but, but everything that you've learned in terms of thinking about eigenspectrums in a real and imaginary sense readily sort of generalized to thinking about hundreds of neurons, thousands of neurons, and so on. Right? So I hope this was sort of a useful thing to go through, because you'll encounter this. If you start working with things like RNNs, you'll encounter this basically almost every day. Um, now, this is also particularly useful because even if you knew the dynamical system for high dimensional data, it's very difficult to see things in, you see things as flow fields because there's almost no way of visualizing a system in 100 dimensions, for example, right? And that's another reason why eigenspectrums are very useful. They, you, you can sort of go away from the flow field visualization and exactly learn these different properties of the system by just looking at the different values of the real value and the imaginary value of the eigenvalues. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a really good question. So in the way that we formulated this, because the equation is an x, um, basically u doesn't really contribute in the same way. So we're not talking about a dynamical system in u. You could basically think about coupled dynamical systems, where the input is itself a dynamical system that feeds into another dynamical system. In that case, yes. Then they'll both have their own eigenspectrums that you have to think about. And there's a lot of interesting things that happens when like, you have coupling between two different dynamical systems. But yeah, that's a good question. OK. So and, and, and story, when in doubt, examine your eigenspector can tell you quite a bit. Right? That's what I want the takeaway of this section to hopefully be. Um, we, OK, so we'll cover a bit more, and then we'll maybe break. And I'll cover maybe a bit more in the philosophy section, then we'll go into some choral discussions. Right? That's how maybe we'll break this apart, because we're reaching 10.30. Correct. That's how we've written it up right now. But yeah. You, yeah, it can be noise. It can be upstream inputs the system's receiving. But it gets tricky when, that, when you want to think about extrinsic feedback. It's a bit more trickier, because then it basically includes a loop between your system and the other system. right? And then you have to either think about the whole thing as one dynamical system, or think of them as like literally coupled dynamical systems. Uh, but all of this is so in the case that you is a feed forward input to your system. Um, so just to sort of highlight, right? I mean, are linear dynamical systems even useful? This is sort of just posing the question because we've done all this sort of work now to understand how linear systems behave. But this is just to sort of emphasize that even if you have a true vector field that looks you know, arbitrarily complex, you can actually approximate this using linear systems. This is a particular method that is a, called a tree-structured recurrent 
switching linear dynamical system. It's, it's a linear model, but basically it approximates a nonlinear system by having different linear systems at different points. So you can basically arbitrarily have a number of different linear systems that can basically fix and identify your nonlinear dynamics. So it's still a very useful thing because you can sort of identify it this way. Another sort of idea is that even nonlinear systems, like if you even have an RNN, you study them at the end um, by linearization, right? So this is the thing that I mentioned before. You basically approximate that at certain portions in state space, they can be modeled as linear systems. And so motifs basically like point attractors, line attractors, unstable fixed points form really form the building blocks of complex nonlinear dynamics, right? You'll see them everywhere, even if you're dealing with nonlinear systems. Okay. So why should we care about these at all, right? I mean, we spend a lot of time working in this space, but I just want to provide some intuition that it's very useful because we can think about neural systems as dynamical systems. And this has a very rich legacy. In fact, back when Hodgkin and Huxley were making equations that talked about the evolution of the membrane potential, those were dynamical systems, right? Those were equations in different terms that captured conductances and things like that. And there's actually a whole textbook by uh, a guy named Eugene, Eugene Izhakevich called Dynamical Systems in Neuroscience, which basically completely expands on this idea that single neurons can be modeled as dynamical systems. It's a very useful read. It goes into a lot of these different things we talked about in even more detail, but it's really modeling single neurons as dynamical systems. Right? It's a very useful way of thinking. The other side of this is that there's an emerging field, right? which really is the idea that population dynamics can also be modeled as dynamical systems. And, this, the, and if you want to read something on this, computation through neural population dynamics by the late Krishna Shonoi and David Susilo is sort of the field's bible in some way, right? I mean, this has a lot of good content on examples where dynamical systems have worked, a lot of more exposition on sort of how do you understand these systems, right? So I hope these are resources that are available. Okay. So I want to spend a slide just talking about sort of, you know, examples in, out there in the field where people have started using methods like this to find really interesting motifs, right? Um, one of the things I mentioned before was that point attractors are really thought to be in many different places in the brain. One common example of this are point attractors of a working memory, which comes from work from Carl Sraboda's lab and, and Hidehiko Nagaki, where they find is that if you actually record activity during a delay period in that activity, you often see persistent dynamics. Activity remains persistent, and they've been, used, they've been able to use both data-driven models as well as actual neural perturbations to show that these neurons and this neural system actually possesses an actual point attractor. So there's actual evidence now that these are not just different ideas that you can talk about when you talk about nonlinear systems, but they actually exist in different parts of the brain. Good questions on this? Okay. Um, you can also get much more complex dynamics. In fact, the ring attractor example is sort of a classical case where we've been able to get some beautiful evidence of an attractor implemented in flies, where single neurons basically are able to sort of form this attractor together. Uh, a ring attractor is a case where basically you have multiple different fixed points aligned and arranged on a ring. So basically, it's almost like a line attractor that's kind of folded in on itself. And so one of the useful things of doing this is that you can represent continuous variables that have like relationships where you, know, you can have more your head, head direction in a particular spectrum of angles, and a ring attractor captures that really well, for example. Um, and there's also emerging evidence that this is found also in mammals, uh, from work by Ella Feed and many others. But really, the Drosophila head system is one system where we've where people have really dissected this, both in terms of connectivity, looking at the underlying uh, connectivity to ask, like, are the neurons connected to each other? How is it implemented? But also in terms of using perturbations to actually test rigorously, is it a true ring attractor? And beyond this, line attractors are the other sort of most interesting way to think about this, right? Um, line attractors are sort of really came into the limelight in the field when they were introduced by Monte and Cicillo, Valerio Monte and David Cicillo, uh, in their famous paper with Bill Newsom where they show that RNNs that were trained to sort of train to different kinds of tasks displayed line attractor dynamics, and they could find exactly the same dynamics in, in recordings from the frontal cortex. Um, and they actually had two different line attractors that was encoding either integrating a motion or color context, and they were sort of competing with each other. Okay. Uh, again, there's also a good review on this if you want to see what's the other evidence for, for attractors out there. Ilafid has a paper uh, as a review on this in Nature Neuroscience. It's a great read if you want to see you know, how rigorously have people explored these concepts in, uh, in, in neural data. Okay. Um, a few more slides before we end. So how do we start identifying these motifs, right? What kind of data sets do you need? Well, how do you start approaching this kind of problem? There's one method of doing this that we often call task-based modeling. This is the idea that's very common now used across different fields. You have an animal that does a task, and you have some data that you record from the animal. And you have an RNN that does a, the same task. That you sort of model the task in the space of what the RNN can do. 
and you sort of look at the equivalence between the RNN and neural data. And this is sort of what was done exactly in Monte and Cicillo's paper. They, didn't fit, they did not fit a dynamical system to the neural data. In fact, they modeled the dynamical system to replicate the behavior. So it's a task-based modeling approach. And this is also kind of the kind of things that uh, you know, um, people do with convolutional neural networks, where they train a neural network and they start comparing its layers with like, recordings from the visual cortex. Um, they've also sort of expanded on this framework to actually show that this framework can also account for the, for the kinds of variabilities you see in different animals. So different animals have different types of dynamical systems, and you can actually do this, and this is what we were talking about some time ago. That was the first yeah, you did? <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay. The other broad way of doing this, and also, oh, yeah, so just as a reminder, um, last year we actually had a lecturer, Jonathan Cow from UCLA, talk both about in depth about the Monte Cicillo task, but also prepare some notebooks for you guys so that you can actually implement this exact thing yourself. You can train an RNN to perform context dependent integration, and you can dissect the RNN's fixed points using Colab notebooks. So if you guys want to use that, uh, all the lectures are online. The slides have a link to it, but you know, this is a, a great resource if you want to sort of learn about how to do task based modeling, right? The other approach of this is what we call neural population modeling, where we directly want to fit neural activity to a dynamical system. And there's just so many different ways of doing this right now. You can use linear RNNs, methods that we call RCLDS that I'll maybe talk about a little later, um, and things like LFADs, which are all just different ways of fitting dynamical systems directly to data. OK, so I think we'll stop there for now. I was going to give you an example of this um, from work in, from, in David Anderson's lab. Um, but maybe let's, it's about 10.45, so let's maybe take our break here, and then maybe we'll come back and touch upon this a little bit and then talk about some important caveats, right, that we have to think about when we do these kind of things. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>